Welcome to module 11 of our introductory management accounting class. In this group of videos, we're going to talk about performance measurement. In our first video, we're going to discuss summary measures. So using a single number to evaluate how the company's doing sort of one number as a proxy for company or divisional performance and companies do use this and we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using summary measures uh, as well um, and so examples I, I pop into mind immediately here when I think of summary measures I think of ROI return on investment I also think of residual income RI and we'll look at how we compute both of those and we'll, we'll hopefully gain a, a bit of an understanding of those uh, through this video and there's there's questions about them as well in the uh, workbook um, in the next video, we'll focus in on something that doesn't use uh, a single summary measure, but uses many, many measures to, to summarize a company's performance, and that's the balanced scorecard. But that'll be the next video. So let's touch on these summary measures. And when I think about summary measures, I think of two broad categories. I think of mark, uh, market measures, and I also think of uh, accounting measures. So when I think about market measures, I'm really thinking about the stock price. So, you know, if I'm trying to evaluate how a company is performing or an investment is performing, uh, there's a scoreboard, right? I can look in the newspaper and the online and I can say, oh, the stock went up. That means, you know, the, you know, if Apple stock goes up, uh, you know, it's, I don't think, totally ridiculous to infer that Tim Cook is doing a good job. And if Apple stock fails, it's reasonable to infer that Tim Cook isn't doing as well. Now, we'll talk about how accurate that statement is, but I don't think it's an outrageous statement just on the face of it to say, if Apple stock's doing great, we can give uh, Tim Cook and the top people at Apple a lot of credit. If Apple stock is continually falling, uh, some of the blame will lie at the feet of the bosses. I think that's fair to say uh, in principle anyway. Um, so, you know, it's a reasonable thing to do. Now, some advantages here. Why would I want to use a market measure? Well, one, uh, I can get the information fast. It's timely, right? I can check the newspaper every day and see how they're doing. I, you know, it's measured just every few minutes you can check this it's an unbelievably timely uh, measure um, other advantages here it's cheap you know we'll look at uh, the balance scorecard which has us gathering all sorts of data all sorts of information it's expensive it's painful if I just say look you're evaluated on the stock price. The stock price goes up, you're doing a good job. The stock price goes down, you're doing a bad job. This is really cheap. It's like very easy uh, to do. I, I think uh, to go with cheap, it's easily understood, right? You would look at this and you would know exactly like, okay, I, I know what that means. I'm evaluated on the stock price. Up is good, down is bad. It's completely uh, easy to understand. Uh, and it's, it's somewhat difficult difficult to manipulate. Now, of course, there's famous examples of manipulation and manipulation does happen, but I think it's difficult to sort of fundamentally manipulate and play games with market measures. Now, what are some of the disadvantages? Well, the big disadvantage of using stock price is short termism. Right. With stock price, people tend to think in the short term and um, they don't think of the long term. They think, OK, how can I maximize short term returns? And you're chasing that quarter because, you know, you're going to be evaluated based on what the stock does in a given quarter, even though stocks kind of ebb and flow. Um, it definitely leads to some short term thinking. Uh, one other item is that, you know, are the markets accurate? You know, I've sort of said it's difficult to manipulate, and I've said the markets provide a reasonably uh, accurate reflection of where things are. But, of course, there can be overhype in the markets. There can be panic in the markets. The stock markets do not always behave uh rationally and investors do not always behave rationally. So I'm evaluating somebody on stock performance when they're affected by 
irrational behaviors that have nothing to do with company uh, fundamentals. Um, so those are some limitations of market measures. So again, big picture here, we're, we're figuring out how we might evaluate the performance of either top managers or um, uh, top uh, executives at companies or divisions, right? Um, oh, and, and one other disadvantage, perhaps we're not in, a, you know, not all companies are public, meaning not all companies are traded on the stock market. In fact, most aren't. So, you know, market measure might be great for Apple, but it's not going to be useful for a privately held firm. So that's just something to consider. So because of this limitation, instead of using stock price, many firms have said, well, well, look, we're not public or we want to evaluate this division of maybe a bigger public company, but the division itself isn't public. So how do I sort of split out this, the activities of the division? And the solution sort of as, a, as an alternative to stock price are these individual measures of ROI and residual income is also used. Uh, now, I'll, I'll get into how these are calculated in the example videos, but just know that they are sort of profit-based calculations. They're, they're how, many, how much profit are our assets generating? That's what both of these are trying to get at. So profit divided by assets on some level. That's what these are getting at. Are our profits driving a lot of assets? So what are the advantages of using a measure like this? And think about what this is measuring. Again, uh, are we using our assets as profitably as we can be? Well, the advantages of this are, again, fairly simple, right? You can look at this and you can say, oh, our ROI went up this year or our residual income was higher this year than it was last. Hooray. Um, uh, again, fairly difficult to manipulate. These all use accounting measures, so accounting profit, accounting assets, and we'll get into more specifics about how they're computed uh, in, in the... Um, first problems of this chapter uh, but you know they're they're fairly difficult to manipulate and similar to um, to market measures they're cheap because you just look at the financial statements and you compute them not like when we talk about um, balanced scorecard where you're gathering all this extra data and you're communicating about it and it just gets complicated and expensive uh, these are very cheap and again it's a proxy for performance we're saying look if we have good ROI this division has good good performance. If we've had bad ROI, bad performance. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a reasonably uh, a reasonable proxy for performance. I, I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Uh, the disadvantages here. Well, a uh, big one is accounting. They use financial accounting measures and financial accounting, I've said, is difficult to manipulate, but it can be manipulated. You know, financial accounting uh, has big limitations. So I'm actually going to use the word limitations. So the market ignores a lot of financial accounting. They, the market price, when I look at market measures, the stock price doesn't always reflect the underlying accounting. Like, BlackBerry, uh, the famous Canadian company, for a few years was having really good um, uh, financial statements. If you looked at its quarterly reports year after year, it, was, it had really good financial statements, but it had terrible stock performance. The reason it had terrible stock performance in its dying years is because the stock market identified that, yes, it's still making money, but with Apple and Google entering the smartphone world, it's not going to be making money for long. They didn't have faith, and the stock market was right. So the accounting performance would have said, oh, it has good ROI, good residual income, but the stock performance actually told the tale. So accounting has limitations. It can't capture. Accounting is backwards looking, not forwards looking, right? It can't capture things that are going to happen. Um, uh, similar disadvantages to the ones above, uh, short-term thinking, we can definitely kind of laser focus on, you know, 
if the denominator is assets or net operating assets, I think would be our denominator. But uh, if um, the denominator is assets, well, I can maximize by just um, minimizing my assets, right? If I have fewer assets to generate the same profit, uh, well, great, I make more money. Also, if I have older assets, you know, let's just say I make uh, $100,000 and I have $500,000 worth of assets, right? 100K over 500K. That means my ROI is 20%. Now, next year, I make the same 100000 but because of depreciation, my net assets, my net operating assets are 490 My assets depreciated 10 Well, 100 divided by 490 I'm going to call up my calculator here. Is 20.4%. So... I made the exact same amount of money. I had the exact same assets, but rather than brand new assets, they were a year old. I would say, oh, I did better in year two. Look, I made 20.4% ROI. That's better. Well, in reality, maybe not, right? It, it, not necessarily so. And so there are problems with using these accounting measures. There are also problems with using market measures. They're good. They're cheap. It's not unreasonable to say, yes, good ROI, good residual income. That's a proxy for good performance. But they're not without problems, as we'll learn when we look at problem 11.1. So that's it for our, our summary measures, again, market and accounting measures. In the next video, we will discuss balanced scorecard, and there's problems on that as well. So stay tuned for the next video.